Welcome to the only place where real, raw, and vulnerable conversations happen with IFBB Bikini Pros to give you an inside look at their struggles, strategies, mindset, passions, and all of life beyond the stage. This podcast is made to inspire, motivate, and remind competitors and the average gym goer that even the most extreme lifestyles and elite athletes have their ups and downs. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I'm your host, Celeste Rains Turk, and now it's time for the Confessions of a Bikini Pro podcast. Today, we're speaking with a transportation litigation slash regulatory lawyer. She's a blogger, a traveler, and a former NCAA division track athlete from, actually, I don't know what division, I want to say division one a track athlete from Haiti who started competing in 2019 in the NGA then came into the NPC at Clash only in November 2020 where she placed first in novice and third in open and after taking the time to really work on her shoulders and develop more she competed in the Mel Chauncey Muscle Championship where she placed first in open then went on to compete in junior USA's where she placed sixth before taking a break to cope with some various life changes just a few weeks before North Americans where she felt she looked completely off. And then after switching coaches and prep for nationals, she placed ninth. And then in March of 2022, she finished seventh place, then took fourth at Junior Nats, third at USA's, working her way up to finally first at North Americans. I had the pleasure of spending some quality time with this woman at the Boss Bodies retreat this past year, which was so awesome. And I am super happy to have her on because we just really hit it off there. And um, I think she's an amazing woman and I can't wait for you guys to learn from her and just hear from her the way that I got to. So welcome to the show, Sophia Bernard. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Awesome. Now, did I get it right? The NC, you got to help me out on that one. The NCAA, what division? Division Division two. Division <laughs> two. That's still so great. Honestly, any college athletics, whew, impressive. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty intense. And that's actually... I feel like just being an athlete is what really helped me in like everything, especially law school. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I can't wait to talk to you about that. And you know, I have to start the episode at least by asking if you have a ritual before your heel hits the stage. Yes. Um, so right before I get on stage and it's actually something I've been doing, I, I used to do it right before my meets, but I tell myself I can, I will, I deserve. And I repeat it until I, until they call my number and I do my routine. Wow. I love that. So when did you start doing that? So I started that, I think, um, either junior or senior year of college. Um, and it coincided with, there was this um, show on ABC family. Um, I think it was called, it was about gymnastics. I can't remember the name of the show, but one of the, um, the leads, like she wrote it down. And then I started really thinking about that and thinking about, um, just like mindset and getting myself ready for things. And I just start. I took it from there and I started doing that. And I did it before every final exam um, in law school too, and, and the bar exam, of course. And then now I do it before I get on stage. Oh my goodness. I love that. Our, our words are so powerful. And sometimes despite all the preparation we do, we can still doubt ourselves. But when we really affirm that we are capable, we are doing the thing and we deserve what it is that we desire or want. It's really validating and can help us just stay grounded in going into those situations. Yes, exactly. And it really just helps you too. Like if you're someone who like suffers with imposter syndrome, just getting that out because the, the I deserve part, I think is is important, especially if you have imposter syndrome, because a lot of times we feel like we don't deserve or that we're not capable did that ever show up in other areas of your life? Yes, all the time and still recent, still now. <laughs> it's like an ever, it's like an ever, you know, battle that I, I deal with. And I think I have a lot more control over it now, but I want to say I've always experienced it. Like if, for, for example, like in track, I never actually peaked. So I don't know what my true like ability as a track athlete would have been because I allowed my imposter syndrome to kind of hold me back and the way I practiced and the way I showed up at meets, like I was so inconsistent with my races until, um, senior, it was either junior year or senior year in uh, college, we got a new track coach 
And part of like our, our programming was my mental, you know, mental yeah. uh, mindset practicing and mental toughness. And so we would do that every day. And that's when I finally started, you know, PRing every single meet. So I never actually did it. I, like I never did not PR. So I, that's why I know that I didn't hit my peak because I was literally hitting a new like fast time every track meet my senior year. And I was like, wow. So if I had more time, I could actually see what my real potential would have been, but I never got to see that. So. Wow. How do you feel about knowing you didn't get to see that in track? So I'm, I feel like I'm at peace with it now. Um, but it is one of my reasons for starting competing because I wanted to have an opportunity to do something where I didn't allow myself to be held back and fully see whatever my potential is. Yeah. I remember reading or or hearing or talking I, I don't remember where but when you started in health and fitness you felt that it reawakened that athlete in you that you had previously buried to just focus on law school and it sounds like that athlete in you remained hungry to be like satisfied and taken to the next level over and over again like that's just part of you is to push yourself that way Yes, yes, that's that's actually really right. <laughs> I think that's exactly what I said too. But yeah, no, that's that's ac- that's accurate. Um, um, because I think you know when I when I got into law school, there's I mean law school is just is just tough, and everything everyone that I talked to and everything that I read, like they all said it was just really tough. So I only focused on that, and I didn't do anything else. So I completely stopped, like you know, going to the gym. I I didn't go on any runs anymore. It was just school um, and then home and then back to school and just studying. And and that's really it. And so I cut everything out and I started I like even writing. Like I, like I was a major writer too. Like I had a blog and I used to write poetry and like short stories. And I stopped doing all of that to focus on law school. So when I graduated and I got into my career, I just started feeling lost because now I'm just working. And not that it wasn't difficult because it's still hard but it just wasn't as intense as school was. And so I had a little bit more free time and I didn't really know what to do. And so what led you to competing? Um, so funny, cause in 2012, I think it was 2012, I went to the gym and someone mentioned it to me in the gym and think he was a trainer. And he was like, you should consider bikini competitions. And I didn't know like anything about like the NPC or the NGA, what the differences were. Um, but I saw a picture of girls and I was like, I'm not getting on stage in a thong <laughs> and bending mm-hmm. over. Like I'm not. And it, it was back then when like the posing was really bad. <laughs> yeah. So I like I let it go from there. And then I started, um, you know, I played around with CrossFit. And so I was going to get into competing at CrossFit. And then I started playing around with the Spartan and I started training for that. And then I, one of my really good friends from high school, her name is Jasmine um rake is i don't know i don't remember where her married name is but i love her and so she was competing at the time and i kept looking at her and her journey and i was truly inspired to do it so then i remember that guy and then i talked to her just to find out what the details were and then she's the one who actually connected me with casey and boss bodies and then that's oh, when i started wow. wow that's amazing so but you weren't always with boss bodies right no, yeah, no. So I started with, I did my first prep with Boss Bodies. And then I did my reverse after that show with Boss Bodies. And then I uh, I took a trip to South Africa and then completely just fell off. So I stopped, I stopped around that point um, for no reason other than just like, I wasn't sure what I was going to do with the sport anymore. And then I, um, I had a, we had a mutual friend um, who she's an IFBB figure and I think she was an Olympian that year. And so I talked to her and then she was like, you should really consider, you know, getting back into it. And I want you to work with my um, first, you know, my, my first coach. And so that's how I got with my most, my former coach. And then, you know, when things didn't work out, I just went back to Casey. Wow. Well, I think it's really awesome that you like were able to experiment, see what you really needed and what would work for you. And when this Fred had told you about competing is that when you started in the NGA or is this when you went to the NPC the NGA um so she told me about competing and she had she kind of did the same thing similar to me I think she started like she she was an NGA pro and I think she did some OCB shows and she had done I think she did a couple NPC shows so she started telling me the difference and um there was an NGA show that was like 
30 minutes from my house. And so that's why I picked it. I didn't, I, I did not know the difference still at that point. <laughs> she, she explained it, but it just didn't click. And I was like, I don't understand. So like, I, I, I just, I didn't know. So <laughs> I did an NGA show and then I did OCB shows and then I finally figured it out and decided to stick with the NPC. Yeah, I think that's that's really awesome. And you did so well when you got into the NPC. And as I was explaining in the intro, like you really climbed your way up. And even when Joe Pishkula was on, he gave you a shout on the podcast and said, you know, you had your moment where things just clicked, you know, and your time came. Um, but was there a time in the journey for you or in that climb where you knew you wanted to become a pro? Yeah, I think um, probably last year after Junior USA's when I got six, because, I, you know, at first I didn't, it's not that I didn't want to be a pro, but back then, you know, looking at the pros and looking at the girls who are nationally competitive, I could not see myself there. I didn't think that my physique could ever get there. Um, so I, I just didn't want to let myself down. So I wasn't really trying to be a pro until I did that show and I saw my pictures and I was like, oh, wow. Oh, we probably could really do this. <laughs> so why not? That's amazing. And before that, did you just feel like an imposter? Was it not on your radar to consider it? Yes, I, I, I did feel like an imposter. And I just like, just to go back a little bit. So I figured out the difference between the NG and the NPC, but I decided to not do the NPC because I did not think I could even be competitive on a regional stage. And it took like so much convincing just to get me to do um, the clash, the first show that I did in 2020, because I didn't think I was like, they're just going to murder me up there. Like, I need to just stick with the NGA and the, and the OCB because even they're too competitive for me. So. Absolutely. And, and did you feel like you were held back specifically just physique wise or were there other things that made you feel like you weren't worthy? Um, I think just physique wise and also just like that central theme of just always feeling like I'm just not good enough to do you know to be great at anything mm. and so when did you realize you could be for competing specifically like I think just probably like after junior USA is when I saw myself up there and, you know, I watched the tapes back so many times. I was like, wow, that's really me. Like, I, I don't know why I can't see my potential, but it's, it's there. And then there was a judge after, um, after the, M the Mel Chauncey, like regional show. And he, so I, cause, so I didn't know, like, I thought it was like unethical to speak to judges. Yeah. <laughs> So after free judging, like I got off stage and like I was rushing to go like meet my sister and my best friend and he stopped me to talk to me. And I was like, oh, my God, am I allowed to talk to you? It was, <laughs> it was like this whole thing. But I ended up talking to him and he was like, congratulations. Like, you need to be ready for, you know, the overall. He was like, you look like pure genetics and hard work. And I really took what he said. And that's when I was like, wow, I don't know why I can't see this in me, but other people see it. And I really need to focus on actually seeing that because he doesn't know my work ethic. He doesn't know what I do, but he could see me on stage and he could see that I work hard. Yeah. And so that's really validating to have someone take the time to stop you and, and recognize you for that. Yeah. Yeah. It felt really good. And that's like the one, that's probably like, honestly, the one feedback that I still remember and will always remember. Not that the other ones like aren't as important, but that one, just because like he spoke to, to about me and not so much about my physique. Mm, yes. And that's what you value. I'm sure in this process is like who you've become after having kind of put yourself and your health in the back seat. Then you went yeah. on to pursue your goals and it's like, that's really nice to have someone else recognize that. Yes. So what had shifted in you, by the way, at that time to make you want to prioritize yourself more and really let go of the belief that you couldn't maintain your relationship with yourself while being a lawyer, or maybe like you had to set all those parts of you aside in order to be successful? So it was also like finally, you know, telling people I work with about what I do and seeing their reaction of thinking that it's cool. Because I, I always I used to think that like if 
if my clients or my coworkers knew what I did, like they probably would think like I'm weird or strange or, you know, not serious enough. And so I never wanted that to be known, but then at, like seeing the reaction and the support that I got from work that, you know, that really helped me to think that I could do it both. And my boss actually, he said, he was like, well, he's like, I'm not surprised about how, you know, like ambitious and organized you are because you're able to do that. And I was like, oh, wow. Like, I didn't know that it read to other people that way. So that helps. And then even though it didn't work out with my former coach, she, one thing that I liked about her was like, she spoke life into me daily. So having like her say encouraging things to me, like almost every day about how she's like, you need to get out of your head. Like you really can't do this. She's like, I'm being serious. Um, I'm not being biased. And so that was really helpful also. Wow. That's awesome. And when you had been like finally committing to this and prioritizing yourself, what did you do to create that balance in your life or to create that commitment so you could be successful now in multiple areas? Um, so the balance part, I mean, I think that it just, I don't know that I have balance. <laughs> so I'll start by saying that. I don't know that I have balance. I don't know that balance really exists. But mm. one thing that I do know is like, you know, when you want something, you just, you, you just make it a non-negotiable. And so that, that part of me has always been there. Um, so I just, it's, for me, it's just really about like organizing my days and figuring out like what I want to do, like how much personal time I want to have how much time I want to dedicate to doing, you know, my actual job, my, my hobbies and spending time with the people that I love. Wow. Yeah, I agree. I don't believe there's necessarily balance in, in the sense that balance almost makes you feel like you have to be perfect. It almost kind of uh, evokes that type of feeling, but it's more so about like what you value and how those things can align with your goals and making sure to manage those areas of your life so that they do feel fulfilled. Do you ever feel like certain areas of your life, maybe during a prep season, don't get the attention that you wish that they could or, or would have liked to give them? Yes. So one of my, uh, one of my favorite people is Chandra, Chandra Rhymes and, and one of her acceptance speeches, she said that I, I forget exactly the quote, but when she's excelling in one area, then it's almost guaranteed that she's failing in another area. And I think that is true because um, we can only focus on, you know, so many things at once and do them very well, um, but so much. And so like when I'm prepping, um, not that my my work falls off, but I'm not overachieving the way that I, I would want to. I'm pretty much just hitting like my minimum ask and not really doing anything further than that. And, and then like spending time with my family and my, and my significant other, like it's, I think those areas suffer too, because I'm not, I don't, I don't know that I'm a hundred percent present because I'm not able to do things without thinking about it. So I can't just like, you know, sit down and like, you know, eat like a whole thing of popcorn with you while we're watching movies and laughing. Cause I, I just have to be cognizant of everything that I'm doing. And so I think to a certain extent, like you're not, I'm, I can't be fully present, even though I'm there fully. Mm, yeah, it's almost like your mind's so focused on the prep and competing that it's a little bit more difficult to put your energy there. Yeah, exactly. And you did experience like a, a lot of maybe reflection after your past season and the loss of someone really important to you. And I was hoping you might be able to talk about that experience and maybe how how losing your grandma during your prep influenced how you saw life and competing and, and maybe pursuing the goal while keeping family in the in the mix. Yeah, and I, I death is an is an interesting thing because it reminds you that you, you know, you were only here for so long, you know, all of us are not immune from death. And, mm -hmm. um, and so you don't want to live without regrets, but then also because we are all here for a limited time, you want to be able to spend as much time as you can with your family and the people that you love. And so for me, one of the things that I, I took from that and still working and, and dealing with is, is learning how to, like, I don't ever want competing to take away or make me choose people over it. 
Um, and so if I get to that point, I think that I'll, I'll start to have like a real conversation with myself about it, but I don't want to ever like, you know, at the end of it, you, you, you're losing someone else and you're thinking, I could have spent more time with you, but I didn't because I chose to focus only on this and not that. So I know, even though, you know, we're, we're discussing that balance doesn't exist there. It doesn't exist, but you know, we can still strive to it, especially in terms of that when we're dealing with people, because people are always going to be far more important than the things we're trying to do and our goals that we're trying to achieve. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, now that's like a standard for yourself where if it starts to be sacrificed, where you're putting competing over loved ones, then it needs to be reevaluated or something needs to change to support that priority shift. Exactly. Because as great as it is to, to win and Oh, I'm sorry. And to have accolades and things like that. Like if you're at the end of it, you're, you're holding the award by yourself. Like it's, does it mean that much still? Exactly. Yes. And so not only do I think it matters be- in that regard, right? Like community and friendship and family and making sure our loved ones are there. It's like, and it is so much more rewarding, but we're more driven by the process anyways so if in the process you don't have like the support or the love or the relationships then it probably won't be as fulfilling anyways and I I don't love when people say like I just shut the world out and do my own thing and then I come back to everyone it's like how unfair to only be there for people when you have already like I don't know it just seems so unfair and unselfish honestly to only be there for people when it's convenient for yourself Exactly. <clears throat> Sorry. Exactly. And one of the things like, so before getting into this sport, I used to always hear the quote that competing is a selfish sport. And I don't necessarily disagree, but I do disagree because it, it doesn't have to be like, yes, it's only you on stage, like only you go into the prep and only you doing these things, but it doesn't have to be so focused on you because the time that we're taking to get ready for the show, it's only like what, two hours, three hours, depending on what your plan is. Right. Um, and so there's, it, it doesn't make any sense to, to zone out the entire world for three hours a day um, for what, you know, a whole 24 hours blocking everyone else when really you only need to do that for three hours. Right. Exactly. Like, and, and your meals are, are you're going you're to have to eat anyways. You're exactly. going to, go to work anyways or do your thing anyways so it's like when you're with yourself in the gym be in the gym and when you're eating your food eat your food but when you and doing your cardio etc posing all that but like when you have the opportunity to incorporate others in your journey it's like incorporate them be present with them too because they exactly and it makes an impact right like how would you say having a circle of friendships or others inside and outside of the industry actually supported your journey? Um, I, so one of the best things I think I've ever gained and will continue to gain for the sport is, is friendship and relationships within the industry, not actually achieving pro status or, you know, any placement. It's the people that I meet in during the journey. Like that is what I'm always going to value the most. And I think that it's just, it, it makes it more meaningful because Last year, um, when I competed, you know, I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't know much of anyone other than my coach. And so I would go to these shows and she wasn't always there. So I would, I'd be by myself most of the time. And it just, not that it wasn't fun, but it just, it, it wasn't as meaningful as it was to me this year, um, going into these shows now with people that are present and that love me and incorporating them into that process. Yes. So true. Like the the titles are great and you can be proud of yourself, but ultimately there's so much more we gain from this sport. Yeah. Now, when you had gone to Haiti, you had this realization about the impact your grandma made. And I just want to go back to that because it's very connected to this idea of community and it led you to really see and reflect on life being about lives you can help and using God-given gifts and talents for making an impact. So I was hoping, you know, now over a year later, how have those feelings evolved and and maybe what are some of the God-given talents you've found or feel you're using to make a difference and kind of continue that legacy? 
Oh, I love that. <laughs> so can I tell, I want to tell people about my grandma, how I knew that. Cause I, I mean, I, you know, I grew up in Haiti for a little bit. Um, and then, before, and then like after that, like we would just like visit every summer, but going to the funeral, cause she had two services. She had one in New York where she was living at, and then at the church, she always went, which I, I didn't go to that one, but my mom tells me that, you know, there was, it was a lot of people there, but the service in Haiti, oh my God it like they filled the streets like the church was wow. huge and there were no seats and the procession like to the cemetery well actually to her house because we uh, we buried her in the back of her house and there were so many people like it looked like you know when you watch like a presidential like you know funeral yeah. service and the streets it looked just like that it was televised. It was like, it was live streamed on YouTube and there were so many viewers. And I was just like, how does she, how did she know all these people? And it's because she, they, they referred to her as like the mom of the city because of wow. what she would do for people and how she would take people into her home and help them. Like, like whether she was like teaching them, you know, feeding them or just like, you know, just being there for them. Like she's always been like that. And even like when she lived with us in America, she would, she would do that. And she was just a very, very involved person and very selfless person because all she wanted was the best out of everyone and so um my god-given talent like that's a oh, I didn't I haven't thought about that <laughs> but I'll say that I so I've always I've had this um feeling ever since I was like a child and I remember you know just waking up in the middle of the night one one night and like thinking that I'm here for a reason and I don't know what that reason is, but I know I'm here for a reason. I know I'm meant to change lives um, and to impact people. And I don't, even, like even to this day, I don't necessarily know what that is. Um, so like, the, I just I just hope that I'm able to make an impact on people somehow, like even if I'm not trying, which I, I don't necessarily try to do that, but it's, it's, what, it's what I want. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And just the story you shared about your grandma really quick, that was so beautiful. And I imagine it must have been surreal. Did you know that that was the impact she had? Or was that kind of like a visual representation of who she was to you, but realizing she was like that to everyone? Yes. So I, I didn't know until I saw it. Like I knew she was amazing, but I didn't know everyone else knew that and that they and that she was there for them too. Cause she was just to me, she was just my grandma. She's my mother's mom and she's, you know, she's a she's always there. But I didn't I didn't know like what she did. And like I didn't live in Haiti as an adult or even a teen. I only like I lived there from I think age two to four. And then and then after that it was just going back in the summer. And so I, I never actually saw it until then and then I asked I did ask my, my mom about it and she said yeah she was like we're not no one is surprised that the that this is happening like this wow that's so amazing and you have been able to really like grow from that experience and you said earlier too that it's death is interesting because it does remind us of all of our immortality really um Wait, that's not mortality. I'm sorry. Immortality? Why am I confused? Mort mortality, yeah. Mortality. <laughs> yeah, I'm like the fact that we're not immortal. Um, and I feel like it's easy to go like day to day and kind of forget this, right? Because we're living both in the moment, but also for the future. And then something like that happens and it just, it just kind of reminds us or allows us to reflect if we're not already doing it every day on what really matters to us. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's, I mean, that's the, that's the biggest takeaway right there. It's just like, just recentering yourself really. And just making sure that everything that you're doing, you know, all your actions and all your thoughts are, are aligned with like who you are at the core and, um, and how you ultimately want to be impacted, impactful. Yeah, definitely. And then, you know, you went on from this experience and you had a lot of like, this is like when you started going up and up and up and competing too, which is really interesting. And, you know, there was that a little bit of discouragement along the time, along the way, and you had uh, many close placings and then eventually North Americans came and you set yourself apart. So what do you feel 
happened across that season to really bring you to the achievement of your pro card? Um, so this year I would say it's so, because I wanted to, I honestly wanted to kind of give up after junior USA because I was just like, okay, like I, I'm going back where, you know, I, and I know like, I think all of us as competitors know that like the ways you improve isn't really by placements because your best look could be 11th and your worst look could be second. So mm -hmm. those things don't really matter, but it's, it's still hard, I think, to separate from that. So when I got seventh place this year, I was just like, okay, I no longer feel like I, that I like it, it was almost like reinforcing to me that I'm not good enough no matter like how many changes I'm trying to make. And then, but hindsight, realistically, I really wasn't lean enough. And so that was the place that I, that I deserved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but so I think the difference um, for this year was that I wanted to give up, um, but I didn't give up and I didn't work like I wanted to give up. I still, I kept my work ethic super high and I stayed super focused, even though I didn't think I could do it. So I, I just, I allowed myself to, to do the work without thinking I could do it, if that makes sense. You almost let the work kind of fuel you becoming that part of you that knows you were not for able. Like you knew you had to do the work regardless. And maybe was part of that because you enjoyed the work? Yeah, I, I, yes, I think so. Um, and also just wanting to prove to myself that you know, I'm not, I'm not the track athlete that I, I'm, I'm not the same person that ran track back then who didn't see her full potential because, you know, I, like I, I would show up to practice and not even try a practice. And that's why I wasn't getting better. And I wasn't trying at practice because I didn't think I could be good. And so, you know, fast forward to now, like I still tried really hard in the gym and I still like ate my meals and I still, you know, did everything to a T and I still practiced my posing. I did all the things even though I still didn't fully believe that I could do it. Um, where back then, like I would have, you know, half-assed my entire prep because I didn't believe in myself and I, and I didn't do that this time. So I think that's, that's a, that's the biggest difference. Wow. But, but like, but just answering your, one of your questions, I, I do sincerely enjoy it. I mean, I've been, I started running track when I was nine years old. And, um, and so like the only thing new to me in competing is just like dieting because I've never really done that before, but like, being active and enjoying being active. Like it's, it's who I am. It's who I've always been. And so I could decide to quit today and I'm still going to wake up at like 5.00 AM, 5.30 and go to the gym and work out. Absolutely love that. Like no matter what, it's part of you. It's your routine. It adds to your life. It supports you. And, and in this journey also, it was like a good way for you to almost redeem yourself and your commitment to, fulfilling potential and pursuing potential even with a lack of belief it was like you weren't going to let history repeat itself exactly yeah that's perfectly stated like I was not going to be that I was not going to do the same thing I did before <laughs> man that's so powerful because a lot of people will will fall into the well this is how I am this is who I am I'll never reach my full potential in anything why bother but you were like that's not who I have to be. I'm going to keep going regardless of the outcome, be it, you know, a success on stage or not. You wanted to feel that you were pushing your own limits and, and surpassing previous PRs, but in, in this regard with bodybuilding. Yes. And did you find that experience as an athlete and your experience in competing and your experience with uh, becoming a lawyer like paralleled each other or had similarities like were there themes in those pursuits yeah I mean like to me everything paralleled everything made sense everything flowed um I you know like one of the like when I was in law school studying I everything I learned from my track coach is how I is what I applied and then you know now that I'm prepping and then competing everything I've learned back then is what I apply now in my, in my, in my day, 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 day routine. And even like as my, in my career as a lawyer, like I apply those same concepts, um, which is really at the core of it, just mental toughness, awareness, and just always trying to be better and do better and recognizing your shortcomings and figuring out how to overcome them and how to fix it. Mm. So that's not always easy to do, recognize shortcomings. 
No, a lot, <laughs> a lot of people do struggle with that, but I've kind of, I made it a thing because I, self-awareness and, and having personal responsibility is important to me. So I, I could be like, if, if I'm upset about something or something doesn't go my way, like before I react, I try to have a moment to myself to try to figure out, you know, could I have reacted differently? Could I have done something differently? Was this on me or was this on the other person? So I try to be as objective with myself as possible. Oh, yes. And I think by being objective and taking personal responsibility, you are eliciting like compassion and acceptance, which allows for growth. Whereas if you just go into like judgment, whether that's of someone else or of yourself, it's a lot harder to actually improve moving forward or find ways to improve, whether that's communication or execution or reaction. It's just difficult if if there's a dismissal of your role in it. Exactly. Because sometimes it's you're the problem. <laughs> we are the problem sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Can you give any specific examples where you realize like that was the case and you had to come to terms with it? Um so I mean the one that I could remember like so for example like developing like I wanted to develop my shoulders back then. And so I realized I had I hired a personal trainer to train with me every day to make sure that that could happen because I realized that maybe it's I'm not getting the results I want because of something that I'm doing. And so I never I I used to not like working with personal trainers and I still really don't, but I knew it was something that I needed. And so I objectively looked at that and made that decision. Why don't you normally like working with trainers? Now I want to know. Because like the gym is my time <laughs> and I don't want to talk to anyone. I just want to get in there and, and do what I need to do and leave. <laughs> and I feel like I get, I get slowed down when there's an extra body there. Like it's also why I don't like working out with you when people are like, hey, can I go to the gym with you, Sophia? And I'm just like, I feel like you're asking me because you think I'm going to personal train you, but you're going to find out that I won't even speak with you. <laughs> <laughs> we can go at the same time <laughs> oh, that's amazing it is like sometimes too you just have these workouts that they feel life-changing like this morning I had this amazing workout and I was like nothing and no one could stop me I'm on top of the world like this is amazing and those workouts also like really and I'll, most of them are like that but some are just extra euphoric and I feel like they really remind you like why you do this. It's, it's so, it keeps you so present. I don't know something about it. No, like you're a thousand percent right. Like you feel present, like you feel accomplished and you just feel renewed. Like I always leave the gym feeling like so refreshed. Like I just took a nap. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes though I end up crashing. I'm like, Oh my gosh, that really took everything from me. <laughs> It lasts like five minutes. I'm like, I'm energized. I'm on top of the world. And then I'm like, I need food. I need water. And maybe I need sleep. And then you're back. One of, one of, one of the things my track coach used to say, which I think like applies here too, is like, you know, no one ever regrets like a run. No one ever regrets a workout. So you might want you might not want to do it or you might be tired, but then you're never going to be like, I should have done that. <laughs> totally. And I mean, there's a lot of things I think that can contribute to how we feel and how we support ourselves. So outside of working out, do you do anything else for like your personal time or to support yourself? Um, so now, nowadays, like probably not as much as, well, I, I do, I guess like now it's shopping. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Shopping Online and- or in, in stores. So only online. I have zero patience for in-store shopping. So I shop mostly online. And then the other thing that I like doing is like, because I, I'm an introverted extrovert, but I think I'm more, I'm, I'm becoming more extroverted now. So I like to, I like to put things together. Like I started doing like this uh, monthly girls dinner. So when we try, because Tam- you've been here, so Tampa is huge and there's so many restaurants and so many cool, like different niche things. So I just I, like, I'll spend time like, researching them and then like, we'll go try them, um, try one new one a month. Wow. What's your favorite one so far? So far, I like Crucellers. It's it's the one that we just did, actually. Um, And I was able to like it. It was really good. I had like a a steak and fries and I love fries. And I I wasn't always a fan of fries until prep, honestly. And now I'm just like obsessed with French fries. So (laughs) you had some pretty good fries and the steak was actually really tasty also. Nice. (laughs) Now, are you like strictly a white potato fry person or do you like sweet potatoes 
Um, so it, I used to like sweet potatoes more because they're always done right. But like, if I can get like a really good like truffle fries or just perfectly seasoned and crispy white potato ones, I'd I prefer those over sweet potatoes. Wow, I'm totally team sweet potato. <laughs> <laughs> sweet potato fries with honey. There's it's so good <laughs> with honey. Yes, honey or like the brown sugar and cinnamon. It's just it's really it just adds a little sweetness to it. I love it. Ooh, that sounds really good. I'm gonna have to try that. So um, yeah. I will, I will. And, and on the subject of like prioritizing other things in life and doing that to support yourself, you just said like, you're becoming more extroverted and, and making time for other people. And we got to chat a little bit about this privately, and I don't expect you to share anything you're not comfortable with, but how does living like the fit life and going after your goals influence things like your relationship or your life or friendships um so i so for my specific relationship the the fitness and the working out doesn't seem to affect it much uh, but like when i get into prep and i start getting ready for a show and then i have competitions that's when you know it it's they it's like oil and water <laughs> almost <laughs> um, so it's not like a um it's not like uh like like he's not really into competing so he 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 doesn't get into it the way that I do he's just kind of like um like I, I think I feel like he might feel like he's restrict restricted also as much as I'm being restrictive um so that doesn't but then as, as far as my friends I think so my friends they won't say it but I feel like they also prefer me out of prep because while I, I will go out with them and, you know, order water or, or like bring my food and stuff like that, I feel like they don't really like it. And, not, and I don't want to say they, they don't like it, but it's, it makes them feel like on the edge. I don't, I don't know. And maybe I'm not using the right words, but I think that they, they prefer me out of breath. Mm. Yeah. So they've never made that necessarily known, but you get that understanding or maybe experience that. Right. Because they're like when I'm out of prep and then we make plans, I'd be like, oh yeah, and you're not dieting. Great. Let's let, we can have drinks and stuff. So they make comments like that. And that's when I'm like, oh, I guess you really, you know, I thought we were having a good time all the time, but I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. And does that change then how you show up for people? Like when you're in prep, like how do you make sure that you're still fostering those relationships? Um, honestly, like it's, it's really hard because I, I feel like I'm trying really hard, but then I don't know if it's being like received that way because like I, I get kind of res reserved a little bit because everyone's drunk, but me. So it's not like <laughs> it's, it's fine, but it, it's not fun also. So I, I try to show up and be present, but then I think like that barrier makes it almost like impossible. Mm, yeah and so it's like it's not the same now does that make you look forward to improvement season more it it doesn't honestly because I I understand how like others might appreciate it but for me it's not it, it, their choices and so like I don't necessarily feel like oh my god I'm in prep I'm so restrictive and then when I'm in off season oh my god it's freedom I don't I don't have those thoughts so I don't feel that I'm just like aware that how it how people treat me differently like in both seasons yeah for sure I love that you don't look at it as like this huge difference or change and I think sometimes before people get into the sport they think it's going to be like this really intense thing with prep and then this really like scary thing with improvement season but there's a lot of growth to have in both so how does a day look like for you normally, like in prep versus improvement season? Are they that different? Like what are, what are your expectations in each? So in terms of like how my days are set up, they're, they're not that different. Um, but I guess like the main difference would be like when I'm in off season, I, I do zero cardio. So I'm only spending like an hour or so in the gym in the morning, so I'm sleeping in later, and I'm going to the gym later. But I'm relative. I'm, I'm starting my days at the same time, regardless of if I'm in or off season. Um, but in terms of of growth, you know, I think off season it, it is a little bit more relaxed. 
you know, I can focus on, you know, more strength gains and more um, like getting stronger and, and, and building more. And so that's a lot that it's, it's more fun. Um, the food aspect, <laughs> it's like a, it's a, like a double edged sword because it's cool to be able to eat more, but then it also requires more thought. <laughs> that's yeah. what I don't like. <laughs> Like I always joke and I'm like, I like my prep macros better because it's easier to make my meals. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I was trying to figure out and, and, and like trying to eat 80, you know, 80 things of fat. Like that's, it's just not easy. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I get you though. There's like a routine too that you get into and as food increases, you're having to like readjust macros or readjust amounts of food. And it's like this, this sport is so day to day year round, like it requires that commitment regardless. And I think that's one of the benefits of like a macro based approach anyway, is that we can have flexibility, but we can also like have that consistency. Exactly. And that's why I like, I, I will only ever do macros. I know some people don't believe in that and think you can't, but I think I'm pretty responsible with my food choices. And so I don't, I don't have a concern that I'm like, I'm not eating properly enough to fuel myself and to grow. Um, and I just, I just like the flexibility and it really fits my lifestyle, it's especially in terms of like making dinner because I can, I'm the, you know, I cook, I cook dinner in the house mostly. And so I am able to like make dinner that's for my prep food. And then also just like make dinner that's not prep. And the main difference is like the portions <laughs> really, or yeah. like some, maybe I'm, I might not have carbs with it, but I can cook the same thing and make it work. Um, and, and, and it's, it's easier for me that way. Whereas if like I had a meal plan, then like it gets a little awkward, you know, trying to figure out like, do I even have time to like make the other person dinner? Like, should I just tell them that they need to make their own dinner like during um, prep? So. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Macros is definitely like cool for that reason too. Cause you still get to satisfy, at least I personally find like for me, myself, as a, I don't want to say as a woman, but for me and my definition of a woman and, and something I like doing as a woman is nurturing and giving and nourishing even like I like to provide for people. So when I was staying with my dad, I got to like cook for him and I would cook him a meal that also worked for me. And there was something really nice about being able to care for him. Or if I'm seeing someone, I want to be able to do an act of service like that, but also participate in it. And to cook someone a really nourishing, healthy meal feels good. And we can always modify it for like our goal. And I think it allows food to be more than fuel in that regard too, while still satisfying like our goal, of course, of physique development or recovery or performance. You know, it's that I'm, I'm literally just like that. Like I just, I like serving people and I like cooking. I, I really enjoy the cooking. Like it's like my culture, like the Haitian culture, it's just like, you know, the, all the women just love cooking. Um, well, actually in my household, it's only, I have seven, there's seven of us and five girls and I'm the only one who can cook. So anyway, Whoa, <laughs> how'd you learn? Um, well, a lot of just like being under my mother. <laughs> and then when I had to um, live on my own, um, it was either that or starve. <laughs> <laughs> So good thing you did that for yourself. Yeah. And it's funny because like, so I, cause I, I ended up like cleaning a lot when our family has things. So like when we're not in prep and are having events, they always want me to make mac and cheese and I cannot make mac and cheese prep friendly. So I end up just making it and on the side, like I make my, you know, my food on the side and I have to ask them like, does it taste okay? All right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, I will say sometimes you just want to make something that you definitely won't be able to fit in to your macros or it's not, you don't even want to bother with the recipe building and like a tracking app. And it is kind of nice to get that feedback from people. But sometimes I'm like, I wish I knew what I just made, because if it's really bad and they're lying, I'll feel terrible. Right. <laughs> they, my family's not, uh, they don't hold back. So they would tell me. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I will sometimes like, you know, in off season, which, you know, goes back to the question about the, the differences in flexibility. Yeah. I will take the time to build in that recipe into my fitness pal and um, make it fit my off season macros. 
Wow. Yeah, absolutely. I, I do the same thing. I'm like, eh. and if I want a bite of something in improvement season, like I'm going to take a bite of it and be like, cool, that's good. And maybe I'll track like 20 grams of something similar, or I won't track it and just move on. And that's fine. Me too. My off season goals, honestly, is like 90%. <laughs> It'd be 90%. That's good enough. Well, yeah. And I, it's all about setting like the standards and expectations for ourselves that feel good for us. And that is sustainable long-term versus like trying to force ourselves in a box and then not meeting that standard, feeling like crap about it and then sabotaging. Yeah, it, exactly. Cause I feel like if you, if your off season, like still feels like a prep, then I think that's when you, you end up always just, just dreading the sport and feeling restrictive and, you know, always wanting to like, you know, maybe binge or, or something else because you shouldn't like off season should be structured and you should be mindful but like, if you want a piece, if you want a cookie, just have the cookie. It's not going to make you gain 10 pounds after one bite. <laughs> right. If anything, it's like the restriction that then leads to the fixation and the binging that will lead to the, you know, compounding weight gain. Exactly. So I want to talk about your life as a lawyer too, because I just find this really fascinating and I want to hear more about like your passion for it or what you know, what that looks like for you and maybe even some of the behind the scenes. So why don't we just start with um, like why you got into law and and what you foresee your future in law being like? So <laughs> my eighth grade yearbook says lawyer. Aww. <laughs> so I, knew, I knew pretty early on. Um, and my dad was like kind of a big part of that. Like we used to watch the practice um and I probably Law and Order and those other legal shows and I was always a very um like independent thinker even as a child and I would challenge my parents a lot because they would say something to me and I wouldn't take it for face value if it didn't make sense to me so I would challenge them yeah. <laughs> and they didn't appreciate it that much but here we are today and I am <laughs> I am an here attorney now <laughs> so. you did it yeah, so that's where I started, and and interestingly, because of, because so I didn't I didn't know any other lawyers growing up, and even I I like I met, I probably met the first lawyer that I knew I think in high school because my English professor was a lawyer, but I didn't know anyone like personally. So the only thing that I knew was criminal, and so that's what I thought I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to be like this state attorney or public defender. And the summer before law school, I interned at the public defender's office. And I had to interview a, uh, a child sex offender. He was 15 years old and he like molested his five-year-old sister. And I was so disgusted and I couldn't do it. And I was like, wow, if I do this, like he would be my client and I would be under an ethical obligation to defend him. And I just can't do it. Cause I, and you can't pick your clients. You can't pick how heinous it is. And so I decided that I wasn't going to do that. And then so in law school, I was exposed to, you know, all areas of the law. And then from there, I was able to see that I could take my career in different places and do different things. And um, I ended up when I graduated working in, as a construction defect attorney. Hmm. And then I left that job and I went in-house working for a transportation company. And that's when I learned about the whole world of transportation litigation. I didn't learn about it in law school. I didn't know about it previously. And I got really invested into the industry. And I started meeting people and I noticed that there wasn't anyone who was doing this that looked like me, um, both female and black. And so I was like, you know what, I'm just going to, I think I'm going to stick to this. I enjoy it. It's challenging. And I see an opportunity for me to really stand out because there isn't much of a presence of people that look like me. And I think this is, you know, something I can, I can make a career out of it. So from there, I decided that I would stick to this niche and I just been growing and making goals to just really be an authority figure within the industry and just really like, just like hone my craft and learn as much as I can. Wow. So fast forward to today. I, so I was in-house then. And so it's not typical to go in-house and then go back into law firm. Um, but that's what I ended up doing because I wanted to get more experience when I was in house, when I was in, in house, um, my boss ended up leaving. And so there was an opportunity there. And so I became the general counsel, which is usually a job for an attorney that's 10 plus years out of law school. And at that time I was what, four years out. So 
the CEO didn't want to keep me in that role because I didn't have enough experience. So he was doing conducting an external search for the position while I was like running the entire company by myself. Um, and I did, I, I did a pretty good job, but they just, actually I did a really good job. See, that's the imposter syndrome. I did a, I did a, I, I killed it. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so because I didn't get, I didn't end up getting the role because of experience, I decided to go back and work for a law firm and which led me to my current job. So I work for a big law firm here and, uh, it's actually in Atlanta, Florida, but I'm a remote worker. And they were interested in me. They, they sought me because of my background in transportation. And so I got the job. And that, at the time, they had just, I think they were they maybe a year into it. But uh, the firm had acquired this, one of the world's largest, you know, company, one of the world's largest companies, and um, acquired their transportation business. And so I was hired specifically to work on that client and to manage a group of, that has now grown to, how many lawyers do I manage now? I think like 10 plus lawyers. And then um, my coworker is on maternity leave. So I'm managing her attorneys. And so that's probably like close to 20 <laughs> different, 20 plus yeah. lawyers that I manage um, now. Wow. Did you foresee yourself getting into a management role? Yes, um, but not this way because it's not really, it's not the norm for law firms. Um, I thought that I would be in a management role when I decided to go back working for a corporation. Okay. I didn't know that I could do that as, you know, in a law firm capacity, but the way that we've structured this client, it works that way. And so that's how I got the opportunity. Wow. Did you experience like in, in that shift of like stepping into a managerial role, did you experience any like pushback because you don't look like how most people look there? Um, surprisingly, no. Um, and it's interesting because the lawyers that I manage have much more experience than I do in terms of how long they've been lawyers. Like some of them have been practicing for 10 plus years and I'm going on my, well, I am in my eighth, eighth year practice. Um, but they don't, they don't, um, challenge me and they respect me and my role. So surprisingly, I thought I would get that, but I have not gotten that. Has that changed your outlook on the field? It has, uh, you know, it has, I think the, you know, when I wasn't in, getting into the field, um, it, the industry did, and I think it's it's true in some, because I always tell people the worst part about being a lawyer is other lawyers. And so I think the, I don't know if it changed my idea of the field, but that I'm in a place that fosters that. Yeah. I think this is the, it's the best law firm that I've, I've worked for um, in terms of, you know, the, the culture aspect. Um, and like, even, like, even the way my boss deals with me, like in a very respectful way, um, and my coworkers are all respectful. And so, you know, and everyone is pretty, and we, we get along when we get together, you know, we go out together, you know, we have a good time together. We're able to like relax and, and take that layer off. Whereas in other places, I wasn't able to do that. So I think, um, in, in another firm or, or managing another group of people, I probably would be challenged and, and, and would encounter some people who were just terrible but not it not in this place. Hmm. That's really really awesome that you were able to find a place that you are comfortable in and you're excelling in, you're thriving in, and you're able to manage others as well. And I imagine there's times where your caseload is a lot more intensive, or maybe there's a higher demand on you. So how do you personally manage your energy and time when you are dealing with that and pursuing goals outside of? of being a lawyer? Um, I've, I've let go of the obsession of the to-do list. That's helped a lot. I think starting out with your day with a to-do list is a good practice, but not being married to it is an even better practice because you have to account for things that are happening. And so in my day, like there, I, I might have some days where I have like X amount of tasks to do and I get all of them done and I even exceed and do more. And then there are other days where there's just like fires and every, and every corner needs to be put out. And so I might never touch my to-do list or only touch one thing and that's okay. And I'm comforted in that. And I don't feel like I failed 
or that I haven't done what I needed to do. So that's really how I'm able to like just, just structure my days better. Cause being a lawyer and dealing with billable hours, like it is very unpredictable and there really isn't any um, boundaries in terms of like when to work, when not to work. And especially working remote, like it's really hard to turn it off. So even in prep and um, like some days I will work to 10 if that's what's required of it. I mean, I don't even take time off when I go to shows. So like the night before North Americans, I was working <laughs> and during USA's, like I, the show started so late on Friday, I took off and I marked myself off. I ended up working all the way until pre-judging started. Wow. How did you do that and keep your stress down? Um, because I don't, I, it's not stressful to me. I think because I, because I, uh, because I've um, like, I've let go of that to-do list and I understand that it's, this is, this is, this is what needs to be done. Like, this is my job. I, I don't get stressed by work anymore. Like I don't get freaked out by it. There are times when it's overwhelming. Like when I found out my coworker was going on maternity leave and I was, you know, going to be overseeing both hers and mine. I had before she, you know, while she was still here, like I was, you know, trying to mentally prepare and like freaking out a little bit, like, okay, how am I going to be able to do it? Like, can I do it? And then like something clicked and I was like, let me reframe this because this is actually an opportunity because you're going to be able to show more people what you're capable of. And so you're not going to realistically get everything done. You just need to get the most important things done. And so that's kind of how I frame it. And so when I work at shows, I don't like they don't, my cortisol does not get affected because my work doesn't stress me out, even though it is stressful work. Oh, yeah. No, I can definitely relate to that. Like, I'll be responding to clients and doing emails and making sure I get stuff done. And I always tell them, I'm like, don't hesitate to reach out to me even on like a show day or when I'm doing an event, because to me, it's just like normal life. You know, I just I live with it. I love it. It's I know how to manage it. And I love the way that you approach your to do list and the way that you explain that, because it's it's almost like we get in those all or nothing mentalities where I'm a failure if I don't achieve everything. But then that means that we forget all the other things that came up. And I had a boss one time when I was um, still working in the personal training field. And he said, you know, in life there's, and in this job, there's going to be clogged toilets where you have all these things you have to do. But if you're not able to attend to the clogged toilet, the business gets impacted, right? It's hurt. You can't run a gym with all the toilets being clogged. So you have to do it. And if that means you don't get other things done, it's okay because you unclogged the toilet. And that really put things in perspective for me. And I always now approach that in my own life. I'm like, how many toilet bowl moments did I have today? And is it okay that I didn't get done these, uh, get these other things done? That I love that because that's, that's really what it boils down to. And the other thing uh, too that I'll add too, like just, you know, bringing back like the concept of dev too, like one of the reasons, other reasons why I, I, I don't like allow my work to stress me out is because, and it's, it's a little bit morbid to think about, but I'm like, if something happens to me, you know, what's my job going to do? They're going to figure it out <laughs> and replace me and go on about it, you know, and that's not to say anything negative about them, but that's just how life operates and works. So, you know, the, the, these things are true. Life life continues to go on with or without you. And so allowing these things to stress you out is not the answer. Yeah, I love that so much. Like knowing you have value and worth beyond like what you accomplish on your to-do list. And of course those things matter and they're fulfilling and they make up your experiences, but it doesn't mean that it defines you. Exactly. So what are some of the behind the scenes of being a lawyer that maybe others don't see, but you really enjoy? The billable hours. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, what's that mean? But help us understand. Billable hours, it's like, it's it's interesting because it just it kind of changes your concept of time. And so the way that we, we so as a lawyer, um, with some practice, some, some I, actually, I want to say, 
in general, because I, I think uh, this applies to most practice areas, but like the product and the service is you, the lawyer, right? Like that's how the firm makes money. Um, and and that, that's the product that they're selling is, is the body doing the work. So to, to track that, like we have to bill our time because that's how, you know, you send, you create the invoices so the client can pay for it. And so billable hours operates like in 0.1 increments. 0.1 is six minutes and like, and it goes up every six minutes. So 0.2 is like 12 minutes and 0.3 is like, you know, on top of that. And so like everything that you're doing, you have to like quantify it, justify it, like write an entire narrative and, and paragraphs and like submit it on a daily basis. <laughs> wow. So you're getting, you're like the billable hours because you get paid to be there and do what you need to do because that's ultimately like a major part of the job yeah like it's i mean like we're you know we're, we're salaried so like the the thing that sucks about it is like you don't you don't get the instant gratification of being paid more for for like you know hitting your targets or going above your targets but it is what you know most firms look at your productivity and your billable hours and they consider that when it comes to like bonus season and and written salary raises and also promotions that's awesome and do you ever or did you ever struggle with like actually tracking those billable hours and billing for your work a thousand percent yes <laughs> it's a it's a huge <laughs> learning curve because again like I don't know why but they, they do not teach you about the billable hour in law school they really should but it's wow. a it's, it's there's a huge learning curve like learning how to capture your time so that you're you're doing things and that you're able to recruit them and you're not because like some people who can't feel like they'll spend a whole day and like only build like two hours and they don't know where the time went. They don't know how they lost track of time, but it's, it's definitely a skill set to know how to capture everything that you're doing in six minute intervals. Yeah. Well, that would be extremely difficult. <laughs> <laughs> also, you know, in that consideration, I find like as a business owner, I, struggled a lot in the beginning with billing for what I was worth or, or charging what I knew I was worth. And it's like, sometimes people see the outcome, right? And I think it's applicable to what you're doing, but it's like people see the outcome and they believe it's worth X amount. But what they don't see is like the investment of education and time and research and double checking and making sure things are good or providing a proper service like that goes into, and, and the systems and the background, like that goes into actually producing this incredible result. Exactly like that. I mean, cause that, that is very true, like in our industry too. So I definitely understand that. And I think, and, and, and to some extent, like I get why people do that because there are some bad actors who like they charge you a price and you get nothing. So then, you know, it makes you kind of like hesitant about other people. So I get that from that aspect, but I don't think clients should generally approach it that way. Like, it's like, you know, let me give you a reason to not pay me before you just decide not to do that in the beginning. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And I, I appreciate you sharing your experience in that as a lawyer. Now, do you foresee yourself staying in this industry that you're in currently, like moving forward as well? Like, do you have retirement goals? What What's kind of your future career vision? So, um, I, if everything goes well, I should be promoted in January to uh, counsel at my firm. And then if everything continues to go well, then I would get promoted to partner. So those are like my immediate goals is getting those two promotions, which should be back to back. Um, and then like, I definitely want to be able to just like continue to develop. Like I want to be able to get some speaking engagements in transportation. I, you know, I, I, I'm in a couple of organizations and I'm looking now, I've applied to some to get some leadership roles outside of that. So I definitely want to start getting some leadership roles and just really continuing to like build my, my book of business and just establish myself. Um, but I don't know that I will stay, you know, in a law firm like forever. I think eventually like maybe 10 years, you know, five, 10 years, I want to, you know, go back in-house and, um, and just like, cause in-house is, it's a, it's more of a, there are no billable hours. So it's a little bit of a slow time. And the reason I want to do that is just, it's a little bit more stable and I do want to have children eventually. And so I think that going back in-house with more experience will allow me to, you know, get the level of responsibility that I want, which is general counsel. And then also have some, you know, more flexibility to be present for my children when I do have them. Ooh, 
I love that. You're really considering like, what does your future look like and how are you setting yourself up to achieve that? Yeah. That's awesome. I've always been, I've, I've always just been, um, I've always just wanted to be a mother. I think, I don't know why, like ever since like just childhood, I'm just like, this is what I want. <laughs> oh my gosh, me too. I had this like baby doll, like carried around and my family was like, well, what's your doll's name? And I said, it's just baby. And they're like, well, no, like we know it's just, a, I said, no, her name is just baby. <laughs> but like, I love just baby. And <laughs> they're buying that because I'm going to talk about just baby, but like, it's just, it's just so silly. But like, I love just baby and just baby was like my, like, I knew I always wanted a baby from the moment I knew what babies were like, I, so I could totally relate to what you're saying in that, like, you knew you've always wanted to be a mom. Yeah, that's so cute though, just baby. <laughs> <laughs> that is not what I will name my future child, uh, but it was fitting, I guess, for my intelligence level at the time. Um, but anyway, I, I love that you're thinking ahead and, um, you're also creating this life now. And that's probably really motivating for you too, because I think when you have future goals like that, and it informs what you currently choose to do, you make decisions that can sustain you, not just now, but also with the life you want. Yeah, exactly. Like definitely just, you know, wanting to be able to like be a, you know, the provider for my kids and give them opportunities that I, that I didn't have. And just, I just, just really just watch and see and, and, and just be part of that. Like, I think that's just really cool. Yeah. hundred percent. So, um, I did want to ask you another thing, cause I, you had mentioned after junior Nats, you felt like you couldn't let go of this pageant girl in you. Did you do pageants before? I did. I started that when I was 14. <laughs> oh, can you tell us more about this? I am. Um, so like growing up, like I was, your, I was a stereotypical, like girly girl and still am a lot. I mean, pink, I am obsessed with pink. Like you come to my house, like my office is nothing but pink. And I, there was a point in time where I would only wear pink clothes. <laughs> I've, wow. I've evolved all from that though. But yeah, I started pageants uh, when I was 14. Like I was just, you know, I just remember just being like, I watched like Miss Universe and Miss America and Miss USA all, all the time on TV and just watching those girls and wanting to be on that stage and just wanting to be them. And so my parents, you know, they were like, what I love about them is that they, they always supported us in every single thing that we wanted to do. So at nine years old, they put me in AAU track and then I told them I wanted to be a model and do pageants. And so they put me in pageants and they would travel to different cities with me so I can compete in pageants and you know, they would try to learn as much as they could so that they could, you know, help me like be successful in it. And so the last, I went to the last year that I competed in pageants was, I did one pageant in law school. So I think 2012 was the last pageant that I did. Wow. That's so crazy. I had no idea. Yeah. So I've just wearing heels and sparkly things and, and getting and doing hair and makeup. It's one of my favorite things because it's the thing that it's, I mean, that's a thousand percent me. It's like who I've always been. Like I, like I truly enjoy, like if I could, if I could have someone do my makeup every day for me, I, I really would do that. <laughs> How do you feel when people say that bodybuilding are just beauty pageants? Um, I can see like what, why they say that like on the outside, but I don't think they fully appreciate it on, on, you know, what it actually is. I think like they, when you say that you're someone who only looks at the end goal and judges it from that. But if you honestly understood like what it took to get to that stage, you wouldn't think it was a beauty pageant. And that's not to say that there isn't hard work put into going into beauty pageants. It's just, they're, they're two different levels of thing. Like when I'm preparing for a beauty pageant, like I'm not um, being like regimented and disciplined I'm like, you know, practicing interview questions for that portion of it. And I'm practicing, that's pretty much it. Like the walk, I, I never really practiced the walk because I like, I've always known how to walk in heels. And so it's really just, it's as simple as just getting on stage and doing like, what was it? Was it like a T walk, like a T walk or an H walk? Like it's, it's a model walk. So it wasn't mm -hmm. anything that I, I ever practiced or needed to. So they're, they're just two different things. And I don't understand why people think bodybuilding is pageantry it is not I think like the WBFF they have some pageantry aspects in their shows oh definitely agree with that especially with the different outfits 
yeah they like they do gowns and everything yeah and um I did one pageant in my life so I can speak a little bit to it. I did. I did one pageant. It was, um, I wanted to do it and represent um, a charity I really liked. And so I was like, well, this is one way to get it out there. And it was an experience. <laughs> what I was did. a charity? And what was the pageant? Uh, <laughs> well, I, I represented Big Brothers Big Sisters when I did it. And the pageant I did was... Um, Oh gosh, with Crowning Glory, I think it was called Crowning Glory Productions. Um, I don't even know now, but basically, like when you when you win, you got the opportunity to like per- really represent them and get people involved in that organization. Um, but either way, you spoke about it on stage. It was a cool thing, though. Like I learned a lot about um, pageants through that, and like I met some really great women and. I'd say I prefer competing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I I can see that, and that's funny. So my um my charity when I compete when I did pageants was Girls Inc. <laughs> was what? Girls Inc. Oh, what's that? Girls Inc. Like I N C Incorporated. Yeah, like Girls Incorporated. I just one of like I, I like I just I like I used to be super passionate, and I, and I I still am really about just like encouraging young girls um to be more than just you know whatever the stereotypical thoughts that of women are and just to step outside mm-hmm. that and, and own who they are and be who they are girl i love that i i think that message is so needed especially in today's world where there's so many girls who feel like they can't be the girl they want to be or the woman they want to be it's like they're told if you're this way, you're not going to be good enough for this. But if you're not this way, then you're not pursuing like the new standard for women or for girls. And so then girls are feeling like, who even am I? And and maybe even questioning themselves as girls. And it's so unfortunate, but to have someone like you represent a certain way or encourage a certain way, like hearing that message, I think is just something we all need to hear and even boys would benefit from this from men you know and I think it's important we empower each other and and represent like you can be anything you want yes and no and I 100% agree especially with the with the boys comment because I like while I like I am passionate in just helping young girls I do think like boys do get left behind sometimes because they're expected to fall into like whatever the stereotype for boys are and like maybe that people think that they're not as emotional they don't have as many feelings and sometimes I think that that does impact them when they don't have the freedom to pursue what they actually truly want because it's not what's associated with men yes oh my gosh it's so sad like if I think about like when I, when I think about having kids in the future, I'm like, I want to make sure if it's, you know, a boy, he feels like he can express himself and he's validated and he has people in his life who validate those emotions and can be sensitive and strong and encouraging and all, all the things without limitation, because like, it's so unfair to put limits on, on anyone just for like their sex, you know, or what society thinks they should be. It's like, empowering everyone to just have their ultimate human experience is so much more valuable exactly I feel like I just forgot we were recording and we were just like having this conversation (laughs) we're just casually having a conversation (laughs) I love it I do I love it too it's just like so easy to talk to you I'm like oh my gosh yeah this is this is awesome. I love um, topics like this too, because, you know, part of this podcast is to show beyond like the stage and competing and all of that. And you've been so real about just different challenges you face mentally and emotionally in this process. And of course, sharing about your career and your goals. Is there anything that I didn't ask you? I'm going to ask you for your best, best advice, but is there anything I didn't ask you that you do wish that I would have or think I, I should? Um, no, I think we did. You do such a good job. <laughs> oh my gosh. I've always, I've known that, you know, you know, just because I've, I've been listening, like your podcast is, I, pr- I probably started listening to your podcast before I even like considered doing the NPC. 
So I think I, I found you wow. like in 2019. It was like the fall of 2019. And so I've been listening like every day, like that long. Like even like oh, when uh, when I caught up with all the current episodes, I was like, well, let me just go back because this podcast has been around for a while. So I was just like, go back and listen to different series. And And one of the things I really enjoyed about it was like, your ability to, you know, keep the conversation going and to make things flow and to ask the right questions and pull things out of people. And, you know, in, in doing this and going through this experience, I, I see the amount of work you put to be able to do that. So like listening to it, it just seems like easy, like it's who you are. And I do think it's who you are, but you also put so much work and passion into it. And that is like amazing. Thank you. Seriously, that means so much to me. Like this is such an important platform. So I do try to like honor this because you are so important to me every athlete is so important to me the listeners are important to me it's like I don't know it feels like a responsibility so hearing you say that's really validating because I do love this a lot yay (laughs) (laughs) so let's get your best advice then what's your best advice for someone who's never competed before but would like to and then your best advice for someone on their road to pro So best advice for someone who's never competed, I think is to, so I get it's, it's, it's difficult to just give one advice because there's a lot of things that I see wrong. Um, I think like a lot of new competitors focus too much on like, you know, reading captions and what people are saying that it takes away from the experience that they should be having. I think new competitors should spend time researching the sport and, and, and what that means is just actually the sport, not researching what other, you know, with certain pros or certain like athletes, what their specific unique experiences are, because oftentimes they're not, it's, the, it's an exception to a rule. It's not a rule. And so just because someone is going through this and they say this happens every single prep doesn't mean that's what your experience are going to be. And just because like someone like rebounds every time they prep doesn't mean that's an expectation of prep. Like this is a truly individualized sport. So I think you should research. And so far as trying to find like, you know, what coach is really going to align with you and not what coach is prepping you know, ex top girl, you need to find a coach that is really for you, not a coach that is social media popular, because a lot of things on social media are smokes and mirrors, especially in this industry. Um, So a coach who's posting a lot is not indicative of a good coach, a coach who has all these athletes in the Olympia, or all these athletes turn pro, or all these athletes doing, you know, whatever is not indicative of a good coach. And you really need to not only let the coach interview you, or just feel like you're honored to be speaking with them, but actually interview these people. Like the same thing you would do like for a job is like, find out if that's going to be a right fit for you. Interview them. Like you are, you are the, so you are the client, you know, you as a client, you dictate the terms of the service. And so you need to figure out everything you need to know for them. So do like responsible research and not just reading people's captions and listening to their stories. Oof. That's amazing advice right there. Um, Before I have you give your advice for someone on their road to pro more specifically as well, I I do kind of want to hear you expand on that. Like, what would you recommend someone consider when they are interviewing a coach? So asked about like, you know, what their different strategies and and, and, and what they mean by that. Um, One of the things in this industry that I've noticed is like, people throw away like sciencey words, you know, mm-hmm. to make it seem like they really know what they're, what they're doing. And I think, I think we need to do a better job of pushing back on them to figure out if they really do. Like before you even interview with the coach, you need to have a list of what your negotiables and your non-negotiables are, because there are a lot of things that people do in this board that do impact your health and can impact the long term. So if these are things you do not want to compromise, you need to write that down. You need to figure out, you know, what, a realistic timeline is for what you want to accomplish. And before you even ask a coach, because they're just going to want to try to get you, a lot of them just want to try to get your money, like really assess your body and maybe ask someone who's not in the industry to see if you truly need a building season or if you, you know, need to just start prepping because you're naturally gifted and you've been doing this for so long. So I think there's a lot of like just looking inward and also just a not taking what people say at face value and asking questions. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. If I could go back in time, I would have told myself that too. Like, don't take it at face value, really be realistic with what needs to be done to be competitive and successful in this. Yeah, exactly. And I say that, and I, I will say like, I was, I was fortunate because, and I'm, this is not me like trying to like plug team boss bodies. 
I was fortunate to find to have found Casey first and then so I found my second coach first. So I didn't deal with a lot of different things that I know like, you know, people who have negative experiences are dealing with because it, it just was never my experience at any point. Um, and I did actually before I did decide to go back to boss Vibes, I did interview a, a few different coaches. Um, and so I, I kind of already knew at that point, like, you know, what I needed. And I, and I was able to just like, you know, read the vibes and decide if that's what I wanted or if that's not what I didn't want. And, and to be honest and frank, like your podcast helped a lot with that. Cause I, I, I heard them first um, before I, I, I interviewed them. So it's, I didn't, fortunately I did not have any negative experiences, but I've, I've seen enough of people who have and heard enough that I just, I just want people to just push back and not feel like you're at the coach's discretion because they need you to create their lifestyle. Mm, yes. Love that. I really just appreciate that advice and expanding on it too. Cause a lot of the times, you know, when we think about, we need to research a coach, we don't know exactly know where to start. So I appreciate you expanding on that. And then what would be your best advice or maybe more specific advice for someone on their road to pro? Do not quit. <laughs> um, if you're on your road to pro and like, you know, there are conditions like provided that you have it sometimes like listening to, you know, the judge and understanding what the feedback is like, for example, you know, at junior year say Sandy was like long-term more glutes, short term, just get leaner. So that signaled to me, I didn't need to quit. Even if I wanted to quit, I was like, well, she's not telling me to quit. So we don't have to quit. Um, so just you, a, a placement is not a reason to quit and wait for the next season. If you truly want it and your body is in a good place and you can handle it, just keep going until you, until you physically get to a point where you can't anymore and then you pull back. But do, you know, do not stop. Just keep going, keep working, keep, keep grinding, and it will happen. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for that advice. And I want people to be able to reach out, connect with you, even continue to follow your journey. So can you let everybody know how they can do that? Yes. My Instagram is Sophia Fit Lawyer. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to put that in the show notes page, you guys. That's always on celestial.fit slash podcast. If you're listening right away, it'll be at the top of the page. If you're listening in the future, scroll down to the category section. It's alphabetized. And the best thing is, it's not only going to give you the link, so the link to our Instagram or other resources we have, but it's also going to give you a full summary of the episode, a breakdown of topics we covered, and episode timestamps. So you can go back and listen to specific things over again or share this with your friends, teammates, loved ones, letting them know why they need to check out this episode too. Your guys' support always means a lot. So definitely tag us. Let us know what you thought about the episode. That goes a long way, not just for me and the show, but of course, for the athletes and for this community continuing to come together. Um, it really does mean a lot. So appreciate you guys listening. And Sophia, thank you for taking the time with me today. Thank you for having me. It still feels surreal. <laughs> <laughs> You're so welcome. It was my pleasure. And everybody listening, hope you all have an amazing rest of your day night or morning, wherever you're in the world while you're listening to this episode.